so hi, ich heiße Manuela äh, Panzaki, so ein Norden, so. Äh, ich arbeite mit Wildrein, zusammen mit einem Sturteam hier in Ina, Olaf Strand, Dram, Perior, Doi, Vegar Gundeschen, Roy Andersen und viele andere. Ich kann nicht mehr Norsch, aber ich bin so flink mit Norsch, so beklage ich, dass ich auf Englisch So, actually, look at this picture. Uh, it's taken by a reindeer called Bella, and I didn't give the name, even though it's an Italian name. Um, the picture is showing about 5.000, 6.000 animals moving from the winter range to the summer range. I think it's spectacular, and I think it's actually spectacular, the whole ecology of these species. I used to say that this is kind of our Serengeti, because we have this big migration here under our eyes. So, so on. Okay. No, the Virker. So, <laughs> reindeer came to Norway before us. They came when Norway was still covered with ice, and they used to uh, live in the coast area uh, when the ice were retreating. They moved northward, and we started uh, colonizing the land thanks to reindeer because we were living of their meat already 8,000 years ago. Then we started uh, building huge pitfall systems and we continued uh, hunting them until actually the Middle Age, so quite recently, in these big uh, uh, fences that were leading to traps. Then we got the fire weapons, and of course that was kind of a uh, uh, yeah, cherry on the cake for the reindeer, so we drove them to extinction nearly at the beginning of the 1900. But this is not a problem. The, that we have now, because now the reindeer are kind of uh, regulated, the harvest is very regulated, and the population is doing very fine. Uh, this is a picture that shows the reconstructed uh, migration and population before the Industrial Revolution. You can see that they were migrating from inland in winter towards the end of the arrow in summer in the coastland. And they were, most importantly, a few populations, and they were interbreeding, so they were free to move, and they were breeding together. However, then we got, yes, the Anthropocene, which is the time when humans started building roads, railway, hydropower, minor roads, cabins, and whatnot. So the habitat got, in the last 50 to 100 years, got extremely fragmented. And this is the problem now for reindeer. Now the macro effect of this situation is that we got, out of two, three population, we got now 23 isolated population in the last century, or even less, 50 years, I would say. And this is not even the situation, because what happened now is that all these stop signs indicate migration which stopped in the last decade. So we have GPS data which show the situation before they were moving around, now they don't move around anymore. Migrations, yeah, we have some few left, but very few. Before they were moving everywhere. Now we have one in Ardangevida and one in the south, and they're actually endangered, or at least the one in the south is quite endangered. Remember that these are the last population of wild reindeer in Europe, and we have international responsibility for taking care of these, these animals. So this is the problem. Reindeer are a little bit shy. They don't really go crazy for, for humans. So what we ask our job is about how can reindeer and human coexist in a multi-use landscape and in the long-term future. It's a complicated question. We have one world and we should share it. Uh, We think that the coexistence can be possible by either dividing in space, reindeer on a protected area or on one side and infrastructures on the other, and or in time. We can imagine that sometimes reindeer migrate in a position, but when the reindeer are not migrating there, we can, for example, allow for the car driving or the people walking or the ski trails. So we should try to find solutions that allow us to segregate in time or in space which is not exactly a very simple task, because on the one side it requires good ecological understanding of the species, but it also requires a very good understanding of the societal demands. We need infrastructures, we need roads, we need uh, hydropower, we need uh, tourism. It also needs to be taken into account the, the local stakeholder participation. People have, that live there have something to say about how the land should be used. And finally, there are legislation and restriction and governance and management which also play a role in this game. So it's a, to answer the question, how can we coexist, we have to answer all these this, uh, parts. And this requires uh, long-term vision, requires teamwork. This is not a one-man job. Uh, it requires a holistic approach. We cannot look at the effect of a road or a power line, but we have to look at the whole network of infrastructure together. 
requires, of course, scientific standard, but most of all, long-term engagement. This is an ongoing process that should keep going on forever. Actually, we are now starting a new project uh, called the Renewable Reindeer, which is focusing in particular on hydropower, but as I said now, it's more the, the network of infrastructure related to hydropower. So how the hydropower uh, is uh, relating to roads, power lines, and all the other infrastructures. It's a new project we have. It will last uh, five years, four years. And the reason for this project is that um, the hydropower has developed before the impact assessment law. So there's, no, uh, there's never been so far an uh, assessment of the effect of hydropower on terrestrial ecosystems. This is our first time, and we're going to take it. And we're also going to suggest mitigation measures, and we want to develop predictive land planning tools to allow people to develop the infrastructure around hydropower without impacting or with the least impact on, on rain there. What we, the way we work is this. First, we want to work, we understand the mechanisms. Then we want to predict. We want to have predictive tools to see how reindeer behavior can change. And then we want to use these predictive tools to aid land planning. This is both in this renewable reindeer project and in our normal research uh, life. We start from GPS data. We got a huge data set of GPS data on reindeer. Every position of reindeer has to be coupled with uh, data on climate, snow depth, whatever. And, of course, it was difficult to handle, so we needed to make a, a special database for animal movement, which is taking GPS data, is taking environmental data, and is giving us a table which couples each location with all the information we need, or how far is a cabin, what's the snow depth, the temperature that day. And this allows us to do science. If I had to summarize in very few words uh, the results, uh, reindeer don't like us. That's the bottom line. Not much, at least. But, of, of course, the devil is in the details. So we are working to try to find uh, why and what and, and the details about it. So the first issue is that the type of infrastructure matters. <clears throat> Some infrastructures are a bit better or less worse than others. Uh, I won't go through all the results because it's quite a complicated story, but if you just look at this picture, the red dots are GPS location in Snohetta, the yellow in Rondane, the pink in Knusso, and you can see the SX, the road in red. You can see that the, the roads are shaping the distribution of reindeer. This is a clip, but all over Norway. It's really a very, very strong effect. They are avoided at all season, up to 15 kilometers, and so and so. Another, uh, unfortunately, a bit unpopular feature for reindeer is the empty cabins, and also private cabins if they are in big uh, concentrations. Uh, you can see here is Noheim, uh, and uh, it has been shown by our study that actually cabins built along the traditional migration routes can really pose a threat to the migration. And then you can look at the trails that go from cabin to cabin, for example, and we found very variable effects. Why is that? If you look at, this is Rondane, and the number of people walking every day on these trails, we can see that some areas become quite a barrier, and some areas look a bit more like, yeah, minor importance. And when we analyze this data together with reindeer data, you can see that if a trail is small, like the light blue here on the left, up to two people per day, yeah, no, no big deal. But if you get more than about 100 people per day in a trail, that becomes an impermeable barrier. So reindeer cannot cross. The red blob is a reindeer kernel density. And you can see that, uh, if, that this blue area becomes an impermeable barrier that cuts Rondane North in two parts. And in fact, in the last 10 years, no reindeer has been crossing this area, so far as we know. Another thing we know is that cumulative effects matter. So the way infrastructure are, are, may, are distributed in space matter. A road alone is one thing, but a road together with a power line and a cabin is a different story. So we have already seen direct effect of roads and cabins. There are other infrastructures that have only indirect effects, like, for example, power lines or cabins or reservoirs. They enhance the effect of roads and cabins, but they don't have... I mean, a power line alone doesn't really always make a big difference. But associated to other infrastructure, that increases the effect of that infrastructure. We also could uh, calculate cumulative effects, and we have actually a quite easy and simple tool that can be used as a... Uh, first aid kit if you want to build, you know how, uh, yeah, uh, what is the effect on reindeer. Finally, some habitats are more optimal than others, so be careful when you plan land use. 
uh, we have developed this map that shows habitat optimality. So you can see, for example, in winter here, we have optimal habitat in Hardangevida, which means that reindeer should kind of move up toward Hardangevida if they could. But there are now roads, so remember, now they cannot do it, but they should do that. In summer, same thing. They should move from, for example, from uh, Snohetta, no, from Knusto to Snohetta. And if you remember my first slide on the migration that they were doing before the Industrial Revolution, that's actually what they used to do. So our model is managing to predict what the reindeer should do. Finally, there are some areas that are crucial because they connect optimal ranges. So we have to identify the migration corridors. This is uh, our stay, is one area. We have winter range and summer range, and we have to figure out how the reindeer go from A to B. And we do it in two ways. First, we look at the step. So what can a reindeer cross? And we made a map that shows what is the friction to a step. So can a reindeer cross a fence, a road? This map is telling us the blue is what they cannot cross, the yellow is what they can cross. And then we want to see, but yeah, how do they still go from the range in winter to the range in summer? Do they go straight, fast and directed, or do they go random? And we made a model that actually can uh, uh, use the observed movement patterns to identify the predicted migration corridors. And if you su see the GPS data on top, the black dots, it fit quite well. Here we have a close-up. The migration goes from north to south. They cross a road. The stars are observed crossing points on the road. And you see our model is kind of quite well predicting the, the crossing points. So finally, how can our prediction be useful? Well, we can predict we've seen where is the optimum habitat, what is the, the connectivity, what is the effect of disturbances. So once we can predict that, we can also predict what happens if you change the infrastructures. And so we can predict the effect uh, on reindeer of changes in the network of infrastructure. Say that you build a new road or a new power line or a new what, whatever. We can also predict what happens with changes in climate, in land use. And we can predict what you can do with mitigation measure. If we plan, for example, to build hypothetically a bridge, we can predict if it could work or not. So in few words, I think I can say that we are trying to answer the question, can we coexist in the future? And that's it. Thank you very much.